October 12th, 1492. A date seared onto the hard drive of humanity. Spanish sailors discover land, leading them an Italian, Christopher Columbus. Maverick, hustler, with his own dream to find a shortcut to the east. His plan to sail west to China. He calculates the journey from Spain will take him just 21 days. He underestimates the distance by 7,000 miles. What was striking about this is that any educated person at the time would know that Columbus was wrong. Undaunted, convinced he's right, Columbus has been all over Europe begging for support for his journey. Spanish monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella throw some money his way. Barely enough to fund the expedition. It's kind of the way that uh, a wealthy person might bet a hundred bucks on poker, you know, without much expectation, but you could afford it. After five weeks at sea, close to starvation, thousands of miles from his target, he reaches land, which he believes is Japan, in fact, it's the Bahamas, off the coast of a vast new world. The Americas. Two worlds, isolated from each other for 10,000 years. It's not only a huge event in history, but it's a, a huge event in the history of life. The Bahamas are home to the Taino people. He sees these people, for the most part by European standards, very tall, very healthy, very good looking, you know, living in a state of abundance. Columbus records their first encounter. The people kept calling to us and giving thanks to God, as if we'd come from heaven. I presented them with some red caps and beads. They were much delighted and became wonderfully attached to us. Living in a different ecosystem for thousands of years, the people of the Americas have no immunity to a deadly threat. Disease. Europeans were sort of swimming in this bacterial and viral soup that was utterly unlike anything over there. First contact with an invisible killer that will one day change the destiny of the new world. But Columbus is on a search for treasure. I kept my eyes open and tried to find if there was any gold. Oh, okay. Not then gold. I saw some of them had a little piece hanging from a hole in their nose. Oh, oh, oh. I gathered that by going further, I'd find a king who possessed in great quantities of gold. So I'll show a little video there, of course, about Christopher Columbus, who, of course, one of the explorers that influenced the Age of Discovery. So. Anyway, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at BRCC. I uh, hope you're having a great uh, week out there. Uh, week two, of course, this is the 
first seven weeks history 1123 class. So anyway, kind of um, update you on, on a few things, of course, going on uh, right now uh, with our class uh, overall. Um, <clears throat> looks like right now I know uh, we have a few uh, assignments out. I do you want y'all to work on, of course, history 1123. Um, the Reformation quiz, of course, that'll be out toward the end of the month. Uh, that's, of course, a major assignment y'all need to work on uh, right now overall. I think if you still haven't sent me your contract policy page, I guess I'll take those still or whatever. But that's one of the main things. And I did have a, I have a new thing, of course, in Canvas right now. There is a discussion thread I started uh, on the study guide. If you want to help me start working on that, uh, of course, help out of the students, of course, about it uh, as well. I think I got the first question answered right now. If y'all want to add on to that, uh, you can go ahead and start doing that, of course. So that's worth bonus points, of course, that discussion thread. All right. So uh, anyway, uh, like I said, this week, of course, we'll be moving on uh, to talk about a bunch of things. Uh, I know the first thing this week we'll be uh, getting into discussing uh, expiration, like world expiration by European powers, uh, often called the age of discovery. So talk about that. Uh, that's going to lead into the colonization conquest of the Americas, which had a devastating effect, by the way, on the Native American cultures. So I'll talk a little bit about later. So if you have any comments, questions, you know, during the live stream, look like we have a couple people watching right now uh, during the live stream. Uh, let me know, or of course, leave me questions, comments later, of course, on my channel. Uh, also, you can email me if you have, a, of course, a administrative question, of course, about the class. Uh, here's the link to join me in StreamYard.com if you want to join me on uh, the live stream, or you can just watch it later uh, as well. Uh, T. Nicholas looks like he's watching right now. Anybody else watching right now live? Of course, let me know. Uh, most of you, of course, will be watching this as a recording. Uh, Abigail is also joining us as well. So if you're having a great, great afternoon uh, overall. So uh, anyway, um, this week, like I said, I'm going to move on. We're going to be talking about uh, the Age of Discovery, which it's got all kinds of names, and it's called, some people call it the History of European World Ex Exploration. It's called that. Some people call it the Age of Discovery. Uh, some people also call it the Age of Discoveries, uh, which go on for multiple centuries, uh, starting like around the 15th century and going up to about, the 18th century. So it's kind of like roughly about three or four centuries that uh, the Europeans begin to explore, colonize different parts, of course, uh, of the world. Now, I'm going to first get into uh, and talk about the Age of Discovery. Uh, you can see here that it involved different Western countries in Europe. Uh, Spain was involved, Portugal, those two were really the first two uh, they were the ones that were really involved in it. Uh, France and England also got involved uh, as well, uh, along with the Dutch. People forget about the Dutch, but the Dutch did a lot of like, explorations, colonization, not just, you know, maybe in the Americas, but most of their uh, explorations and colonization was in Africa in part, part of, of the East uh, and close to like the Pacific and all that. So, um, the peak of it, like I said, 1400s is about when it starts and, of course, goes up to uh, the 1700s. Uh, now, there were a lot of different uh, major reasons for why the Europeans were involved uh, in exploration. Um, we've kind of got a list. I'll get into a, a different things. When you look at this kind of world map here, you can see how a lot of the European powers began to explore different parts of the world. So pretty much into the Americas, uh, into Africa. Uh, you can see into also parts of Asia, like India, entry into China, Japan. Uh, you can see also close to Indonesia, Philippines, and then eventually by the 18th century, uh, of course, like the British get into like Australia, New Zealand, uh, et cetera. Um, now, of course, there's a lot of different factors which, you know, influenced uh, exploration. Uh, kind of, we can go back a long way uh, and take a look at that, but you have the Crusades. Uh, the Crusades were 
a series of holy wars where uh, between the 11th and the 13th centuries, uh, mostly the Catholic European powers uh, tried to take over the Middle East uh, from Islam. And what happened was they came into contact with um, East Asian trades, like trade goods, spices coming from the East, silk, gunpowder, things like that, uh, which were vital. Uh, and so uh, all of that basically influenced exploration later. I think they consider that to be one of the first things that really had an impact on exploration uh, was the Crusades uh, right there. Because I think pepper, like black pepper, I know especially, is one of the major uh, you know, trade goods that they wanted the most. Uh, other things like tea, uh, paint, and other things like that came, you know, came west eventually over time. I'll get to that other ideas later too. Uh, also, the Renaissance, uh, which was this period uh, in Europe where Europe came out of the Dark Ages, starting in Italy, uh, then spread to the rest of Europe, and it was this uh, kind of a, rive, a revival of. Greco-Roman culture, and they think it eventually led to modern times. I uh, think Europe became more secular, and so people began to emphasize more individual achievement. Uh, however, it did lead to like new ideas spreading, new kinds of technological innovations uh, were big. And you see, it, one of the biggest things that happened, you know, between that period, 13th, 16th centuries, of course, was the development of the print and printing press, uh, especially the so-called movable type printing press uh, developed by Gutenberg in the mid-1400s. Uh, so that, that helped to spread a lot of the ideas of the Renaissance, just like it spread a lot of the ideas of the Reformation uh, and all that. And so books were printable, were easier to get, uh, and that in, ended up you know, influencing a lot of explorers. Like I think Columbus was influenced by it, I know, uh, and all that. Uh, then, of course, new types of sailing vessels had a lot to do with that, which one of the most famous was first developed by the Portuguese a lot, uh, which was the so-called caravel, especially about the 1400s. Uh, the caravel was a type of um, merchant ship primarily uh, that was used uh, throughout Europe, and they used it to sail across the Atlantic and even around the world. Uh, and uh, they used what they call Latin uh, rig sails or a Latin sail uh, to be able to sail against the wind. Uh, and I think I've got images showing you uh, caravels, uh, what they look like. Uh, here's a caravel, uh, which I think the caravel originated uh, from influences that went back uh, to uh, likely the Arabs and maybe even to the Greco-Roman times. Uh, and um, it's a type of ship uh, that, uh, of course, used a rudder, as you can see, uh, and uh, it used like this triangular sail that you see that's on the back of it. It, it enabled the ship to sail against the wind, which to tack against the wind, uh, you had to zigzag uh, your ship, uh, as you can see in that picture on the left. And so, yeah, it took them a long time to sail distances uh, because of the fact that you had to go into the wind. And if you're going downwind, it's not that you know, difficult. Uh, but the average caravel, I think the earlier ones were about 50, 60 tons, with the average length being about 40 to 60 feet. The uh, average crew is about 20 to 30 men. Uh, and so like early caravels, like the Nina, the Pinta, you may have heard of, uh, like Columbus had. Later, later, later type of ships ahead with the so-called Carac or the, uh, the Neo. It was another type of ship that was similar to a little larger caravel, uh, which was a little bigger, 100 tons of the crew, maybe close to about 50 or more. Uh, but these are the kind of ships that they used pretty much uh, in the open sea. Uh, and that's before you get into like the galleon ships that come later, uh, those large ships, uh, multi-deck ships that have have uh, more square rig sails, uh, especially in the age of sail, which was big starting really in the 16th century. So there's some replicas of the Nina and the Pinta, of course, which were later used by Columbus. They also talk about the travels of Marco Polo. Marco Polo, you've probably heard about him. He was this Venetian merchant and explorer that uh, explored Asia, 
Oh, he went to travel to China at one point. I was even a minister under the court of uh, Emperor Kublai Khan. Uh, and uh, his travels were later written down in a book, uh, I think when he was in prison uh, by a fellow inmate. And uh, it influenced a lot of people uh, to want to explore Asia, uh, the East. And they think that book even influenced uh, Christopher Columbus uh, and all that. But they think that was important, uh, Marco Polo, because it helped to open up trade between Asia uh, and Europe, especially Italy. And so for a while, the Italians dominate a lot of the Asian trade uh, between East and West uh, that went through like Constantinople as it went towards Italy. So it seems like Venice, uh, you know, G Genoa, uh, Flor uh, Florence and other cities uh, were big, of course, uh, in the Asian trade and all that. Uh, they also have, uh, I won't easily mention about uh, Claudius Ptolemy. He was also an influence on later exploration as well. Uh, Ptolemy was this, um, he was this uh, geographer, uh, astronomer, mostly a scientist uh, who in the second century in what is Egypt, he published this work that's called Geography. And it, it had basically one of the first world maps ever published. Uh, and so a lot of his geographical ideas uh, were influenced an influence on other people later. Uh, so he talks about this great ocean uh, that's to the east. And so a lot of sailors wanted to sail that way. Like I think Columbus thought that if he sailed over to that eastern part of the sea, he'd be able to get there. Uh, and so um, he was a big influence. Uh, although obviously there was a debate about how big the world was. Was it round? You know, of course, some people even thought the world was flat. Uh, I think more educated people thought it was uh, more of a round or whatever. Uh, but that's obviously something that uh, was an influence to that particular book. So anyway, it uh, looks like Diamond's joining us in StreamYard uh, right now. So um, another influence, too, is technologies. I've got kind of some pictures of some things that were kind of an influence uh, also on the age of sail later. And uh, the magnetic compass, which you see on the left there, uh, was something that originated from China that came, I think, came to pro probably Italy and Europe in the Middle Ages. And uh, this enabled sailors to, you know, sail east, west, north, south. Uh, so it enabled ships to navigate properly uh, on the sea. Uh, the other invention you see on the bottom is the so-called Mariner's Astrolab, which they think that the Arabs helped develop back in the Middle Ages, like close to the 1200s. And uh, Portuguese mariners started using it around the 15th century. Uh, the Astrolab was very important because it could be used to determine a ship's latitude, like where it was uh, on the Earth. And it also could tell, like, the time of day, like what time it is, um, by mostly using like the angle of the sun. Uh, and uh, the only thing about early sailing, if you know about it, was they couldn't get the longitude. Uh, that's something they wouldn't be able, really be able to do until the 18th century uh, using the moon, uh, believe it or not. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of something you start seeing. Uh, and then uh, on top of that, uh, you get um, the development of like maps, like map maving, what they call cartography, and something that was real important uh, in the age of sail. You know, sailing ships a certain direction, you got to have you know nautical maps, you know, basically nautical char nautical charts. Uh, and so um, the Portolan charts uh, was something that the Italians developed in the 1200s in the Middle Ages, uh, which the Portolan charts were basically uh, these maps that depicted the ports, like where all the important ports were uh, in their world, sailing world. Uh, and uh, the earliest charts, which you're looking at there, which I guess go back to the close to the Middle Ages, early, late Middle Ages, uh, depicts like Africa and Europe. It's probably a 15th century map uh, right there you're looking at, but it depicts pretty much Europe and parts of North Africa in it. So at the time, they kind of know that part of the world. It's very limited, you know, knowledge. 
uh, at that time uh, in the 15th century, but most people thought there was Europe, North Africa, and part of Asia, and that was about it. They didn't really know much about what else was out there uh, besides that. Hey, Diamond. Uh, so anyway, um, so yeah, because I got the Astrolab, uh, and then there was something else I did want to mention about, uh, which is true about uh, exploration, which had a major impact on it too. That was the fall of Constantinople, uh, which occurred uh, in the year 1453. Former Byzantine Empire, which had shrunk uh, since the Middle Ages, it was actually conquered. Their capital of Constantinople was, cap was captured in May of 1453 by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, it was an Islamic you know, empire, uh, often called the Turks uh, for short, where Turkey is. They conquered it, uh, and uh, that that's very important because it closed off the Silk Road. Uh, so the Europeans, you know, couldn't get all this trade uh, from Asia, and so Italy, Italy basically, and all these other European powers uh, had to search for alternative seat, alternative routes to get to Asia, to get to the trade, uh, and obviously, sea the sea routes, like going by sea, was the best way to go. Uh, so. That's pretty much, uh, you know, the thing that's going to really, really cause exploration uh, is the European powers being forced to do that. So uh, there's other things, too, I don't have really, you know, listed there that were, you know, things that were kind of an influence uh, on exploration. But here's kind of a list of things you could throw in there. Obviously, technologies like guns and gunpowder. I always talk about gunpowder you know, guns and steel and disease. Uh, those are things that'll kind of be pivotal uh, in uh, giving the Europeans an advantage, uh, especially when it comes to conquest and colonization. Uh, the disease thing was something they didn't really know they had. You know, it was kind of an edge because uh, it helped wipe out a lot of the indigenous peoples, especially the New World. Uh, and so that's something that you have to understand that was kind of an advantage they had. So... That's going to enable the Europeans to eventually do all that later. Now, I'm going to move on to talk about, uh, of course, the fact that the Europeans, um, under the Portuguese, which you blow up here, um, they were the first to really explore, like in modern times, uh, in the age of discovery. Uh, so they always talk about Prince Henry the Navigator. I think everybody's heard of him. And... Um, Portuguese were very interested in getting into and exploring parts of Africa. Africa had that Saharan trade that was there that was going east to west. Uh, and so that was something that they wanted to take advantage of. And there was even a legend going around called the Presser John legend, uh, where there was believed to be some kind of Christian king that was in the east, uh, the, some kind of king or kingdom uh, where this ruler had asked for help. From the West. Uh, and so uh, the Portuguese wanted to find out where the state was. Uh, some people thought it was in Ethiopia. Uh, some people thought it was in Asia. Uh, and so they think that helped spur on uh, the Europeans to want to get involved with the um, Saharan trade. And of course, in parts of Africa, the big thing they wanted was gold, uh, salt, ivory. Uh, and of course, the Portuguese, as you know, later were famous for infamous uh, for starting a lot of the African slave trade, like in modern times. So, yeah, Prince Henry is usually known as the so-called father of Portuguese exploration. So he, he's the one that got started. Uh, some of you claim that uh, he's also the father of world exploration because they think after him pretty much exploration began. Uh, the, the term navigator is a modern term. Uh, that was apparently invented by later historians. I think it was just two German historians that kind of started calling him that, and the name stuck. But his real name was actually Dom Henrique of Portugal. He was actually the son of the king of Portugal, King John I. They called him the Duke of Vizu. And a lot of his policies were very important in developing the Portuguese maritime empire, which will stretch, by the way, into Africa, but also into parts of Asia and later into Brazil as well. Uh, they do think his explorations led to the discovery of islands such as Madeira, 
you may have heard of, uh, the Canary Islands. And then they also began exploring parts of the Western African coast, like the hump of Africa uh, that basically uh, sticks out. Uh, and um, I'll get to later explorers that they have, uh, but uh, you'll eventually see uh, that they begin to explore different parts of uh, Africa. Let me kind of go to this map, uh, which is uh, right here. Uh, but eventually, over time, what's going to happen with the Portuguese? The Portuguese are going to sail down the west coast of Africa. See where it says Guinea right there? Uh, the, that's one of the first areas that the, that the really that the Portuguese find, which is the Gulf of Guinea often called the Gold Coast or parts that are also called the Ivory Coast. And so uh, that was one area that they start going into. Also, see where it says Angola on the southwestern coast of Africa. They'll eventually sail down to there uh, as well. They'll find the Congo River, like the mouth of it, around the 1480s. They'll keep going down eventually until they reach the bottom of Africa, where it says the Cape of Good Hope. So eventually they're going to go from north to south, sailing down the coast of Africa, then finally figuring out that they could sail around the eastern side of it to get to Asia. Now, there's several explorers I did want to talk about that came later uh, after um, Prince Henry died. Uh, I did want to talk about Bartholomew Diaz. Uh, Bartholomew Diaz is very important as an early explorer uh, for the Portuguese why is he important? Uh, he's considered to be the first European uh, explorer uh, to reach the tip of Africa, uh, which he did uh, in 1488, uh, using about three ships. Uh, Diaz eventually hugged the west coast of Africa, sailed down past where Angola was, and then rounded the tip. It was one of the main things he did. And so at that point, the Portuguese start to realize that they can get around uh, Africa with a sea route that'll get to like Asia, like India at that point. Uh, you can see here it gets around where the uh, tip of uh, the Cape of Good Hope is, where well, South Africa is, round of the tip and then turned around and went back. Uh, the term Cape of Good Hope, by the way, oh, and by the way, uh, Diaz had a ship that was very famous. It was called Sao. Cristoveo, which uh, in Portuguese means St. Christopher. It's probably considered one of the first famous uh, sailing ships uh, in the age of sail. Like this is before like Christopher Columbus, his ships and all that. And um, the term Cape of Good Hope was a term that was coined actually by the king of uh, Portugal, King John II. He's the one that came up with the name because Diaz, I don't know if he knows or not, but Diaz uh, called the bottom of South Africa, he called it the Cape of Storms. There's a lot of storms down there. And John thought that would scare sailors off or whatever. He, so he called it Good Hope because he thought it was, a, it was a good thing that they'd be able to reach, you know, Asia by going around Africa. So it's a good sign, you know, obviously that that had changed everything at that point. So there's Diaz. Uh, Diaz will later go on an expedition with another uh, explore that I wanted to talk about too, uh, which is Vasco da Gama. Da Gama is considered to be one of the greatest uh, Portuguese explorers. Uh, and um, da Gama is important because he was the first European uh, to sail to India by sailing around Africa, the tip of Africa, which he did between 1497 to 1498. Uh, so he reached, reached India in Calicut, 1498. So I go about almost a year. And um, he would go on to be, by the way, Portugal's greatest explorer. I think they talk about him and maybe Ferdinand Magellan as being a pretty good explorer. But uh, he was actually involved in three expeditions that sailed around Africa uh, to India at one point. He was later made the first uh, Portuguese viceroy uh, that controlled part of southern India. Uh, so he's, he's pretty important uh, to Gama. Uh, and um, you can see the route he took, too. So he obviously went down to the tip of Africa and then sailed up the east coast uh, past uh, Mozambique and Madagascar and Somalia and then sailing through the Indian Ocean. 
uh, reaching India. Uh, this is very important, by the way, uh, because uh, the Portuguese from there were able to build a vast maritime empire afterwards. So from there, from India, they then sailed eastward close to Indonesia, and they, they took over where Malacca is, Malacca, the Malacca Strait, uh, where, you know, close to where Singapore is now today. Uh, the Strait of Malacca was very important because it controlled a lot of the trade there, uh, going from, like, China to India. Uh, later, the Dutch will take it over, if you know about that, uh, in the next century, uh, I think in the 17th century. Uh, also, the Portuguese uh, got into China, and they also got into Ch Japan. This is, like, about the 1510s. Uh, so their empire will stretch uh, all the way uh, to the east, and then also, um, if you read about uh, this other uh, explorer, Pedro Alvarez Cabral, uh, he's well known too. He expanded the Portuguese empire even more. Cabral, if you know about this, is the one that discovered uh, and claimed Brazil uh, for Portugal in the year 1500, uh, which I think they kind of already knew about at this point, uh, maybe because of other explorers like probably because of uh, Ves America Vespucci or whatever, but he was able to go in there, sail in there, and just snatch it from the Spanish because the Spanish were, you know, were trying to claim most of the, of the New World at that time after Columbus had found part of it already. Uh, and so that was something that uh, Port the Portuguese were doing at that point. So that's why if you go to Brazil today, most people you know, speak predominantly Portuguese. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna move on next. We're gonna we're gonna of course talk about uh, this other explorer that we have that comes in, uh, which is uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, so he's of course uh, one of the most influential uh, explorers that you have that really affects affects the you know New World uh, later. And uh, Columbus, a little background about him. You see him in that picture right there. Uh, Columbus, uh, of course, was of Italian origins. So he was Italian. Um, if you know about, he was originally from, uh, born in the city of G G Genoa, 1451, uh, in Italy, uh, and uh, died 1506, you can see. And of course, he's very famous for his discoveries of the Americas in modern times, uh, sailing with, of course, the, what's later Spain. Uh, at the time, I think Castile is the actual uh, state that actually finances actual voyages. And uh, Columbus uh, is famous for being, have, he had four, he didn't just have one, he had four voyages uh, to the New World, uh, which the Spanish Empire helped, like I said, finance uh, at the time. And um, i got this map here uh, and show you, um, just right here, at the time, uh, the Spains, as they were called, I guess, was made up of multiple states, with the two main states being Castile uh, in Aragon. Castile was the one that was more profitable uh, as a kingdom. See, the other ones you see there, they were kind of added later uh, to it, as or parts of it, or Spain, they're added later. To the west is Portugal, you can see uh, right there. And uh, anyway, uh, the monarchs that backed them were Queen Isabella, uh, the first of Castile. Uh, and then you had, of course, her husband, uh, which was. King Ferdinand II of Aragon. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, Castile, of course, Queen Isabel was the one that pretty much backed uh, the expeditions uh, of Columbus. And Columbus, by the way, uh, had gone to different, he had gone to different nations. Like it wasn't just that particular country that Columbus was looking for uh, for his expedition. Uh, he tried, I think, the Portuguese. Uh, the English and the French uh, were kind of interested also in his ideas of, ex of, of, of exploration. Uh, Columbus wanted to sail westward. That was one of the things he wanted to do that was kind of unique, uh, to sail to Asia, to the Indies. Uh, and, uh, of course, a lot of people thought he was crazy, I think, originally, some of his ideas. Uh, and <clears throat> anyway, um, if you go to this, uh, picture here showing the different um, ships he was given. Like his first voyage of Columbus is really the most famous. 
Uh, he was given three ships, uh, the Nina, uh, the Pinta, uh, and the Santa Maria. Uh, first two, by the way, uh, were uh, caravels. Third ship, the Santa Maria, was what they call it, Karak, or something called it, Neo, uh, as well, uh, which is a larger ship uh, that was the flagship of, of Columbus on the first voyage. They had about a crew of 90-something men uh, that were involved in boys uh, as well. You see, the Santa Maria was about 100 feet long, and the Nina, Nina and the Pentas were a little shorter uh, overall. Uh, Columbus, by the way, called the Santa Maria, he called it the La Capitana, uh, which meant the captain's ship. And uh, the ship would set sail uh, in early August of 1492. You can see from the uh, southern port of Spain called Palos. So I think I got a kind of a map showing you the actual, uh, of course, there's the replicas. There's been several replicas that have been made of the, of the Nina and the Pinta uh, right there. So those are the kind of ships they actually used to sail uh, across the Atlantic uh, at that time. All right, here's kind of a map of the first voyage of Columbus. You can see here uh, that he set sail uh, really at a more southerly course toward the Canary Islands, uh, where I think he had some ship repairs. And then from there, uh, he sailed across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, more of a westerly course right there. Uh, they think he sailed through what is called the Sargasso Sea, uh, which is kind of between the Bahamas uh, and Bermuda. Uh, and um, what is, uh, they think, uh, early October, October 12th, uh, being the famous date, 1492, uh, he discovers uh, part of what is the Bahamas, uh, which is east of, of Florida, uh, in the western part of the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, they think he landed on an island that is called San Salvador, uh, which um, San Salvador what the Spanish called it. However, the natives uh, had another name for it, which Columbus wrote in his diary, uh, which is called Guanahani, because that's the name that they called it, uh, basically. And it's at that point uh, that Columbus, like you saw in the video, he has the first meeting uh, between the, the Europeans and, of course, the Native American cultures. Uh, he, he meets the so-called Tianu people, uh, that live on a lot of these islands throughout that region. It has devastating effects later. As you know, a lot of these European diseases, uh, like smallpox, uh, measles, uh, will, will kind of, of course, devastate their populations, uh, kill kill majority of their people off uh, because of that. Uh, you can see that map, uh, too, uh, in, in the first voyage. He continued, uh, and they discovered Cuba, uh, right, right there, he says, I got Cuba right there. And then he also sailed uh, to what is uh, Hispaniola, which is where Haiti and the Dominican Republic is today. Uh, they think right above Haiti, like the northern coast of Haiti, uh, the Santa Maria shipwrecked, became a ground. And so he took part of the ship of the Santa Maria and he built a fort out of it. Uh, in, on the northern coast of Haiti, which I think they called it uh, La Navidad or Christmas because it was around Christmas time. And from there, he went back to uh, back to Spain uh, from there. Uh, however, when he came back on, I think, the second voyage, he found out that the uh, colony had been wiped out by Native Americans. Uh, I don't have like a map showing you the other voyages of Columbus, but Columbus also later did explore part of the Caribbean Sea. So uh, just about all the major islands uh, in the Caribbean were discovered by Columbus, whether it be Puerto Rico, uh, Grand Cayman Islands, Jamaica, uh, the Virgin Islands, uh, Trinidad, uh, Tobago, uh, any other other kind of you know island you can think of, uh, he pretty much discovered it uh, overall. Uh, he also explored the eastern coast of Central America, uh, going down there, I think, close to, I want to say, maybe where Costa Rica is today. He also got into the northern bays of Venezuela. So a lot of you don't know that. 
No, but he did sail and departed like where South America is uh, today uh, as well. I can't see it on that map, but he did have a, he had a brother that's famous named Bartholomew uh, Columbus. Uh, and uh, on later voyages uh, in 1498, uh, he became famous for founding Santo Domingo, uh, which you ever heard of that? Uh, that's now the capital of the Dominican Republic uh, today. And uh, believe it or not, that is actually the oldest European city that was founded in the Americas. Yeah, it's, it's, there's no no other uh, Amer uh, no other European style city uh, that's older except that one. All right. Um, now let me talk about what happened after Columbus. So Columbus had all these you know voyages uh, that he had uh, afterwards. Well, they had this thing called the uh, Treaty of Tordesillas uh, that came out after Columbus came back. And of course, with the Portuguese discovering their stuff as well uh, in the East and also Brazil. Uh, and what the Treaty of Tordesillas did was it divided the European discoveries between the Spanish, like their state, uh, and the Portuguese. So Portugal and Spain started dividing things up uh, between East and West. And uh, the Pope got involved. Pope Alexander VI was kind of concerned that this would cause a war between those two states because of all these new territories that are being found. Uh, and so he says that they ought to divide the, the world up, the globe, uh, based off of territories where the Spanish have discovered stuff and the Portuguese have discovered stuff as well. And so uh, initially what was supposed to happen was that the Spanish were supposed to get most of the new world like North America, South America, and then the Portuguese would get what they discovered in Africa and later in Asia. Uh, and so, um, but what happened was when they drew the line down through Greenland, through the Atlantic Ocean, they didn't understand that South America was actually more to the east of North America. <laughs> and so uh, the Portuguese were able to steal Brazil. Uh, from the Spanish because of Pedro Cabral, you know, uh, and so that's that's how that you know all came about. But a lot of the other powers, like you know France, you know, England, the Dutch, and other powers, ignore all that and don't really uh, agree to it. So it's only just those two countries that try to do that. Now they have this other thing I, I usually talk about too, uh, which is very famous uh, about. Uh, the aftermath of, you know, Columbus in 1492. And uh, you have this thing called the Columbian Exchange, uh, which came out, uh, and I think like the name itself was coined the 1970s uh, by this man named Alfred Crosby, uh, who, by the way, wrote a book about it, uh, which I'll share with you, which is called the Columbian Exchange, which was published in 1972. He was a historian and um, basically, he said that what happened was that when Columbus discovered the New World, uh, it created this exchange of things between the New and the Old Worlds. So the worldwide trading of plants, animals, diseases happened because of the interaction between American Indians uh, and Europeans. Uh, and so it's all kinds of things that were exchanged back and forth uh, between, you know, East, West. If you go back to that that slide here, you know, with the Columbian Exchange, uh, you can see all kinds of things came from, you know, the old world. And stuff came from the new world. So basically, the new world had things like uh, vanilla, uh, beans, uh, cacao, which is chocolate, pineapples, tobacco, uh, different kinds of peppers, sweet potatoes, squash, pumpkins, turkey. Uh, peanuts, potatoes, tomatoes, corn. Uh, so all these things you think of today uh, that we have now that we eat uh, all came from the New World. Uh, like, just think about it. They, if they, I guess if they wouldn't have found all that, uh, you wouldn't be able to have, you know, tomato sauce on your pizza. You know, no French fries at McDonald's. Uh, no peanuts in your M&M. No turkey for Thanksgiving. No pumpkins for Halloween. <laughs> you know, things like that. Uh, so no tobacco, you no know, cigarettes, you know, none of that would exist. You wouldn't be able to tell any corny jokes if you get that. 
<laughs> so, uh, and then of course the old world brought things over to the new world. So honeybees were brought over, sugarcane, yeah, uh, bananas, grapes, citrus fruits, onions, olives, turnips, coffee uh, came from the old world, peaches and pears, all your types of grains, uh, or a lot of your, uh, you know, crops like, you know, like vegetable kind of crops, like greens and things like that, pretty much came cabbage, lettuce, all that came from the, pretty much from the new world, from the old world. Uh, livestock, especially, of course, cattle, sheep, pigs, horses, all that came from the old world uh, to the new world. Of course, you see on that far uh, right side there, diseases. That's one thing that is very famous, of course, that they brought over uh, to the new world. Smallpox, influenza, typhus, measles, malaria, diphtheria, whooping cough, all that, of course, you know, obviously devastated the populations, you know, the native, indigenous Native Americans, you know, especially the measles and the smallpox were probably the big ones. I think the only thing I could think of that was like disease in the new world that was brought to the old world is the theory that maybe syphilis, uh, you know, basically may have been one <laughs> that might have been brought over, you know, just Interesting about that. Uh, but um, it had devastating effects. Like, you know, basically they think that about 90% because of the diseases, they think that 90% of the Native American indigenous populations may have been wiped out uh, due to like things like smallpox and other types of, of, of illnesses, measles. Uh, now it's COVID, right? COVID. Uh, of course, coming from maybe Asia, they theorize about that uh, as an example. Yeah, swine flu, too, I think has come from like parts of Asia uh, to the West uh, overall. Uh, you can't see it there, but uh, later, um, you know, between Europe, Africa, uh, and the Americas, they do have this thing called the Triangular Trade Route. Uh, that's It doesn't really come about till later, uh, the Triangular Trade Route. I want to say starting really close to like the 17th century when it starts, you got all this vast trade that starts where Europe trades with Africa, Africa trades with America and back and forth. And it does spawn a lot of the African slave trade. That's something that's kind of notorious about it, as you know. Uh, people like the Portuguese and others uh, started to uh, get slaves in Africa and bring them to the Americas. Of course, you have the famous Middle Passage uh, between Africa to the Americas where something like 12 to 13 million slaves were transported uh, in ships across the Atlantic. And they think maybe close to about two to three million uh, Africans die. Uh, so I think most of them ended up in like the Caribbean and South America, uh, et cetera. Uh, but that, that part of why they did that, I'll get to later, is because of the fact that Indian slavery didn't work out. Uh, a lot of the Indians died, and so they replaced them with, with Africans is what happened. Now, um, I'm going to, of course, move on uh, to talk about uh, also another thing that's kind of famous that occurs, I guess, in the aftermath of Columbus. So as you know, uh, the Americas don't really get named uh, after Columbus. They get named after this man you see here named Amerigo Vespucci. Uh, Vespucci was an Italian explorer uh, who sailed for the Spanish uh, and the Portuguese. If you go to this map here, uh, you can see that uh, he was involved in at least two main expeditions. Uh, first one for the Spanish, uh, 1499 to about 1500, where he explored like the Caribbean and part of South America, like the northern coast of it. And on a second voyage, he sailed for Portugal, and he sailed down to where South America is, like close to where Argentina is. And uh, they think he's the one that found the... Uh, the uh, Platte River down there, Rio de la Plata, the famous uh, river down there close to Buenos Aires. And um, the reason why Vespucci uh, is important uh, is because of the fact that Vespucci was one, is one of the first to figure out that the New World is a separate, separate continents, like North and South America, uh, from Asia. Because, uh, you know, Columbus was saying that that this is part of Asia uh, that I found. Uh, and this, of course, they find out that's wrong. 
about that. And um, part of why Amerigo Vespucci became famous was he had this letter that he published in 1503 that was called the Mundus Novus Letter, uh, which means New World, New World Letter, which later became like a popular pamphlet uh, throughout Europe. Uh, and it supported his idea of the New World Theory uh, that uh, Americas were separate continents from Asia. Uh, and so because of that, that's why, you know, if you know about the Americas, ends up being named after him. But it's named after his uh, name, Amerigo. And it's actually from his uh, Latin name, Americus Vespucius, of course, his actual name that he goes by. Although I think his actual name, Americus, is actually a um, kind of a Latinized version of a Hungarian Catholic saint named Saint Americ. And that's where the name uh, supposedly originated from. So because of because of Amerigo Vespucci, uh, over time, you know, they start using the word America, the word New World, uh, being used a lot uh, as well in the West. And so eventually about the 16th century, uh, you start seeing world maps like this one. Uh, which is the so-called, um, it's usually called the Theaterum, Theaterum Orbis Terrarum. That was considered one of the first major uh, world maps to really come out, uh, which was done by this Dutch cartographer named Abra Abraham Ortelius. He created the first major world map, which depicts the whole world with all the continents on it. Uh, so you can see North America, South America, uh, Europe, Africa, and Asia. There. And I guess it's down there is Antarctica also well, on the bottom. Uh, and so that's basically the, the map of the world that we'll kind of see. It kind of doesn't quite look like that, but it's, over time it's going to eventually shape into something like it is, of course, today. Now I'm going to move on. We're going to also, for a few minutes, I'm going to talk about Ferdinand Magellan uh, as well. Uh, he was a well known explorer just as famous as probably uh, Christopher Columbus. Uh, Magellan, as you know, is one is this explorer for the Portuguese. Uh, actually, he's a Portuguese explorer for the Spanish that uh, was involved in a uh, expedition in 1519 that became the first to circumnavigate or sail around the world, the globe. Um, so uh, originally they think that Magellan, <clears throat> he was actually called Ferdeo Magellas was this Portuguese uh, that had basically uh, switched the Spanish. And uh, part of what he was trying to do, uh, Magellan, Magellan was trying to seek a westward route uh, where somehow the Spanish would go around uh, what is South America. And, and in, anyway, um, so... He was seeking this westward route. That was the main goal, uh, where they could reach what they called Spice Islands, which are called either the Malucca or Maluccas, uh, which are very close to Indonesia, which the Portuguese at that time had already had discovered it, uh, going back to like the, I think, 1510s. Uh, and so Spanish backed him. Uh, they had an emperor at the time, a ruler, king, king and emperor later, uh, King Charles, or Emperor, they call him Emperor Charles V, of course, in Europe later, uh, Holy Roman Emperor, but he was young, real, real young at the time, and hired Magellan. And uh, anyway, Magellan was fitted with five ships. Uh, I'll put them on the screen, but the ones are the San Antonio, the Santiago, uh, Conception, Trinidad, and Victoria. I think most of them were uh, Neo or Carax. Uh, they were involved with the actual expedition. And the amount of men that were on the expedition were about maybe close to 265 men or so, uh, were about it, and probably some boys. And uh, he would sail southward uh, through the Atlantic Ocean, down toward down toward the you know tip of, of South America. And I uh, do have, have maps kind of showing you um, like the actual voyage itself. Uh, that went around the world. Uh, so you can see they sailed southward uh, through the South Atlantic uh, and then go around the tip of Af South America and then wind their way through the Pacific Ocean. Uh, the actual Spanish 
thought that it would be shorter to go west rather than east. And I think, in fact, Magellan had tried to go to the Portuguese to get up this expedition, expedition of the Moluccas, and they rejected him. I think they thought it was probably shorter to go in Africa, which it is. And um, the one thing about Magellan, Magellan uh, is very famous uh, for discovering uh, what is the um, Strait of Magellan, uh, which, of course, bears his name uh, today, which is on the bottom of South America. Uh, he's also very famous for uh, later naming uh, the Pacific Ocean, which originally he, all, originally he called it Mar Pacifico, uh, which meant peaceful sea. So there they say ocean. Uh, but that's, that's some of the main things he initially, of course, was known for discovering. Uh, and um, here's kind of a map showing you uh, the Strait of Magellan. Of course, you can see the one of the famous ships, uh, the Neo Victoria, by the way, the only ship that survived the expedition uh, out of the five original ships. Uh, before he actually sailed into the Strait of Magellan, he actually lost two of his ships. Uh, the San Antonio uh, apparently mutinied uh, against him in the first year and went went actually back to back to Spain. It didn't actually complete the voyage uh, with him. And I think the other ship, which is the Santiago, it actually shipwrecked off the coast of South America. And so by the time he sailed into the Strait of Magellan, he only had three ships left. So I think the Spanish gave the tip of South South America. They called it Tierra del Fuego, uh, which means the um, land of the fires. I think because they saw a bunch of Native Americans uh, burning fires at night, uh, basically there. Uh, of course, if you go back to the map here, he, like I said, he sailed through the uh, uh, Pacific, which the, the Spanish end up finding out that the Pacific Ocean is vast. It's huge, like much larger than the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, they discover like the Mariana Islands, and he finds what they call Guam. And some of those islands you've probably heard of, like, you know, Ten Yen, Guam, Saipan are kind of there. He discovers a lot of those islands that are there. And then sailing westward, he eventually came across uh, the Philippines, uh, which you see there, Philippine Islands, uh, which he named after the son of um, of um, King Charles, uh, who was King Philip, Prince Philip, I mean, at the time. Uh, and so um, exploring those islands, as you know, you can see here that Magellan uh, was eventually killed uh, in the Philippines. Uh, apparently, he was on the island of Mactan, so-called Battle of Mactan is what they call it in the Philippines. He was killed by some Filipino forces uh, that was led by this Native American, uh, excuse me, this Native uh, chief named uh, Lapu Lapu that killed him. Filipino, I think it was a Datu, as they call it, like a type of chief or leader. He was killed on the beaches trying to get back on a ship. Uh, and so uh, because of that, um, basically, the expedition will be taken over by this other uh, sailor who was a Basque sailor named uh, El Cano, Juan, Juan Sebastian El Cano. He would take over the expedition. He's actually going to later sail the Victoria back to Spain. Uh, they also, um, they only had two ships left when they eventually do reach the Moluccas. Uh, the, the, only, the other ship that was left was the Trinidad. Trinidad and Victoria were the only two that survived uh, up that point where they finally got there. Uh, took them almost like two, two and a half years uh, to reach the Spice Islands. And then after that, what happened was there was a disagreement about how they want to go back, like the Spain. And so El Cano wanted to go back and sail around Africa, uh, which he did with the Victoria. And the Trinidad tried to sail eastward back the way they came uh, through the Pacific, the Trinidad was actually captured by the Portuguese. So basically, El Cano, like I said, is the is the one that brought the uh, Victoria back, the only ship that actually survived uh, the actual expedition. They arrived back in Spain in September of 1522. Uh, what's amazing is that only 18 men actually survived the first circumnavigation of the world. 
but they found out a lot of things, you know, about the world uh, that they didn't know, like how where the continents were, the vastness of the Pacific Ocean between the New World and the Old World. Uh, so those are things that they kind of found out more about uh, the world as it is uh, because of the voyage of, of Magellan. And a lot of times they call it the El, uh, Magellan Elcano expedition or something like that is what some people call it. They call it different names, I think, uh, today. Uh, but it was was the first attempt to go, like, sail around the world. Uh, I think the next after that is Francis Drake will do it for the English. Uh, actually, the Spanish tried it again. Uh, that's the thing that's suicidal about it. But they have this thing called the Loeza Expedition uh, that happened in the 1520s where El Cano uh, went involved, was involved in that. Uh, they tried to sail around uh, South America uh, to try and reach the Spice Islands, and most of the fleet was wiped out. I think they got seven ships and only one survived. And they had like, only like 20-something men, I think, lived. Uh, so until they built like the uh, Panama Canal, uh, to sail around South America uh, was, was more difficult uh, to reach like part of Asia. All right, I'm gonna, I've got a few minutes left. I'm going to also talk about a little bit on some of the different... Um, I'm going to go into kind of here's kind of a map showing you uh, the different. Um, you can see where they're exploring at that time. You get get the French involved, the English, uh, the, even the Dutch get involved, and even Russia gets involved in exploring different parts of the world. So I'll kind of go into some of these other powers that were also involved. Uh, and explorations uh, as well. Uh, one of the first they talk about that's outside of like Spain and Portugal is really uh, you have the English uh, that get involved, later the British that do some ex explorations. And they had this one explorer that was actually his real name was Giovanni uh, Caboto, uh, who the uh, English or British called now John Cabot. And uh, under King Henry VII, he was also called Henry Tudor. Uh, he actually got Cabot to do some expeditions uh, for, for for England. And uh, the English had been trying to get Columbus to back some voyages for him, but they basically, Spain, you know, snatched him up. Uh, and so uh, there was talk of maybe some kind of route, like a Northwest Passage that would reach, you know, Asia. Uh, and so that's part of why Cabot was involved uh, in this expedition Cabot's famous for discovering part of North America, which, by the way, hadn't been found, I guess, by the Europeans since, since the Vikings, close to about 1000 uh, A.D. And so around 1497, they think that he explored part of like what is now today uh, Newfoundland, uh, maybe part of Nova Scotia. Uh, and uh, there's different maps showing John Cabot's uh, expeditions, but some claim he maybe explored areas that are right there from close to Maine, maybe uh, Nova Scotia in Newfoundland. So in that map, and he did have two voyages uh, to the New World uh, that were famous. And he had a son, too. He, he had a son named um, Sebastian Cabot, uh, who was involved in expeditions for England and Spain uh, later uh, as well. So they're kind of like a father and son uh, explorers that were kind of involved in some early expeditions. So the English are kind of kind of use that to kind of catapult to eventually try to colonize uh, that part of uh, like especially in Canada early on. Uh, now also another explorer, like especially with the English and also the Dutch, that's pretty important, uh, is Henry Hudson. Hudson was an English explorer uh, that mostly sailed for the Dutch East India Company. Uh, it's part of why the Dutch later would try to colonize part of, of North America, especially around New York. And uh, Hudson is very famous for trying to search for the so-called Northwest Passage I talked about, uh, which a lot of people thought existed uh, somewhere above North America that would take you to Asia, which it kind of, it kind of does exist. There is a Northwest Passage, but it's just you got to sail through icy water. Uh, in the north. Uh, and so Hudson uh, in ships like the Half Boon, which were kind of famous uh, in his voyages in the early uh, 1600s, uh, was involved in 
multiple expeditions. I think I've got a map showing you some of his expeditions, but some of the areas that he explored uh, that's well known is the Chesapeake Bay, like close to where you know North Carolina, Virginia is uh, today. Those are areas that he would uh, first discover on some of his early early voyages. Uh, the Hudson River, like that area on Hudson Bay, uh, is areas that he'll kind of um, the yeah, Hudson River. Actually, excuse me, Hudson River, and uh, he actually sailed up the river. Believe it or not, uh, close to where Al Albany is. Um, so you can see he kind of sailed up like around where Maine, Nova Scotia is. And then also in a later expedition, like one of his last ones, he sailed up into Upper Canada uh, as well, finding the so-called Hudson Strait, uh, which is up there uh, in the northern part of Upper Canada, and sailing into Hudson Bay, which now you know bears his name. Uh, and uh, however, what happened was uh, he basically... Um, his men mutinied against him. Uh, and so uh, they're not sure what happened to Hudson. They think he died somewhere up in Canada. He may have been captured by Native Americans. There's been some speculation about that. But he had four expeditions total, I think, at one point. Well, Hudson, those are the main areas that he mostly uh, explored that's famous. Uh, then you have another explorer you may have heard of that's well known, which is um, James Cook, uh, who a lot of people just call Captain Cook. You've heard of that name. And Captain Cook was a British explorer. He was also a great cartographer, mapping parts of like Canada, mapping parts of like uh, the Pacific Ocean, Australia, New Zealand, etc. And in the 18th century, like mid 1700s, he was involved in three voyages. Uh, two of them, by the way, that went like that circumnavigated the world, which is true about that. And he's mostly famous for exploring the Pacific, uh, exploring parts of like the east coast of Australia. Uh, he circumnavigated New Zealand uh, at one point. He had, had several ships he sailed, I think one called the Discovery, but his most famous ship was the HMS Endeavor, which you see a picture of right there. It's kind of like where they get the name of the shuttle, I think the space shuttle, and at one point they called like the Endeavor, uh, where it came from, and you can see there, he found like a lot of the, the like the Polynesian islands that are in the South Pacific were all found uh, by Cook. He discovered Tahiti. Uh, he discovered like Hawaii, which I think back then it was called the Sandwich Islands. Uh, he even explored parts of close to the Arctic Circle, like around also Alaska and all that uh, as well. Later died in Hawaii. If you know about that on his third voyage uh, around the world or attempted to, uh, and uh, so Captain Cook, he might be one of the greatest explorers of the, of the British and maybe of all time in the age of sail. Now, moving on, let me also talk about uh, some other uh, explorers that are kind of well-known. Uh, now, they have Jacques Cartier, uh, who's well-known uh, as an explorer. Uh, he's, he's one of the explorers we'll kind of talk about first uh, that was there. He's one of the first major French explorers uh, that you have that come later. Uh, although they think he was influenced by this other explorer uh, that was named um, Giovanni de Verrazzano that had, uh, they think, explored part of North America and Canada uh, in, in the, in the uh, 1520s. Uh, and so uh, they think that influenced the French to come back uh, eventually uh, and explore. <clears throat> and um, Cartier is important because he's really the first uh, French explorer to really get into Canada, like go into the interior uh, and explore it, uh, predominantly in the 1630s and 40s. And uh, basically, um, this leads to the founding of New France, which will be the French colony uh, that's basically there. And uh, what Cartier is well known for uh, is he's the one that will discover uh, the Gulf of St. Lawrence uh, and the St. Lawrence River Valley. Uh, that's on the eastern side of Canada. Now, at one point, his voyage actually goes all the way down, sails all the way down to like where close to where Quebec and Montreal are today, you know, famous Canadian cities that are, that are there. And so... 
that's primarily what he's known for. Uh, it's got his St. Lawrence. Uh, he did try to colonize Canada, uh, which, like I said, the French called New France, but uh, it actually failed. Uh, the actual colony. And um, he is the one that coined the term Canada, uh, which he called the country of Canada's, named after some uh, Native American villages uh, that were nearby uh, from the Indian word Kanata, uh, which means either village or settlement. But it's not to the British that they really use that name, you know, quite extensively, because the French, like I said, uh, preferred it to be called um, New France. Now, more famous than him uh, was another another uh, Frenchman named Samuel de Champagne, which I'm sure you've probably heard of. Uh, and um, <clears throat> Champlain uh, was a French explorer. He was a soldier. He was a cartographer, like a map maker, uh, is mapping a lot of the east coast of Canada, uh, etc., and also under uh, King Louis the Thirteenth of France, uh, he became the first governor of of New France, you know, French Canada, uh, and all that. And um, Champlain was originally before he became a governor, he was involved in a lot of expeditions to explore uh, the interior of Canada to go you know go further uh, from what you know uh, Cartier had done before. <clears throat> and uh, you can see he was involved in numerous voyages. Uh, where he even explored, by the way, northeast coast uh, of like New England, like from Maine all the way down to Massachusetts. He may have explored at one point Nova Scotia. Uh, he went down, of course, the St. Lawrence River. Uh, he went to Vermont. Uh, he found Lake Champlain. Uh, and then, of course, the most famous thing that he did uh, that's well known uh, is he, he found the Great Lakes. Uh, at least a few of them anyway. I think he found Lake Erie, Lake Ontario, and I think Lake Huron. Those three great, three of the five lakes, great lakes uh, that are there between Canada and the United States now. And um, what happened was after he came back, um, he would end up, if you know about this, founding uh, Quebec City. Because uh, apparently Louis XIII wanted him to kind of try to govern that area, the new colony they were trying to found rather than trying to explore or whatever. And so in 1608, on the bluffs of, you know, where, where Quebec is, uh, overlooking the St. Lawrence River, he, he started building the capital there of New France. And that would be the capital of that French colony until 1763, uh, up to the French and Indian War during the Seven Years' War. So he's very important. Uh, Champlain is often known uh, as the father of, of New France or French Canada, uh, and he's still kind of a, a figure that's kind of looked up to still in Canada today. Now, I've got a few minutes. Let me also talk about another uh, French explorer that's well-known named Robert de Salle. I'm sure a lot of you have heard of in Louisiana. La Salle was a French explorer uh, who was known for exploring like the Great Lakes, uh, Ohio River, and of course, especially the Mississippi River. Uh, he had been heavily influenced by these two explorers named Joliet uh, and Marquette, uh, who had explored the um, upper part of the Mississippi River in the 1670s, uh, down to about where the Arkansas River is. And so uh, he wanted to find out where the source of the Mississippi River went. Uh, and so if you know about this, uh, LaSalle used uh, like Indian style canoes uh, to eventually uh, use the Illinois River, I believe it was, to get into the Ohio River Valley, uh, which he was one of the first Europeans to explore. Uh, and he went down there trying to build like forts for the French uh, there and also uh, along what is like the lakes of Lake, Great Lakes of Lake Huron, uh, Lake Michigan. He was involved in building a lot of forts there. And the most famous thing that he did uh, was uh, in 1682, uh, he was able to get an expedition uh, that could sail down to the bottom of the Mississippi River because nobody had ever done that before. And so uh, in April of 1682, he was able to reach uh, 
the mouth of the Mississippi River, where the Gulf of Mexico is. And so from there, uh, he actually claimed all the land of the basin of the Mississippi River, like where it drained from uh, and into the Gulf of Mexico. And that became known as La Louisiana, uh, or as they say now, Louisiana today. Uh, that La Louisiana was the actual original name. Uh, it was called, it was named after King Louis XIV. It actually meant the land of Louis, is what it means. Uh, and um, anyway, uh, the French will later come back and try to colonize it, uh, as you know, within the next decade or two. Uh, and so uh, that'll be actually the southern part of New France. Uh, it's actually the bottom of it. Uh, and so France for a while is going to control a lot of land that goes from like Canada all the way down to the Mississippi River at one point. Uh, La Salle had this other expedition, which is famous. Uh, it was called the Texas Expedition, where he tried to find the Mississippi River from the Gulf of Mexico, and it failed. Uh, he ended up stranded in Texas, uh, and uh, his own men eventually mutinied against him, and it killed him. I think he was trying to colonize Louisiana early on, uh, but it failed. Uh, one more explorer I'll talk about before we go today that I did want to mention about, uh, which is well known. Uh, there's a man named um, Vitus Bering, you may have heard of. And uh, Vitus Bering was this Danish explorer uh, that was hired by the Russians under Empress Elizabeth. And they were trying to figure out what was east of Siberia, because uh, at that time the Russians were trying to colonize it. And so... Um, the Russians called him, I think, Ivan Ivanovich uh, was his nickname. Uh, and so he went on some ex two expeditions to, to sail into like the Bering Strait uh, and Bering Sea. Uh, and uh, if you go to this map, uh, which is uh, right here, you can see it's two expeditions. He had one expedition, first one, 1728 to 1730, uh, where you can see he sailed into the Bering Sea. Uh, and also discovered the Bering Strait. Uh, and then on the second expedition, 1733 to 41, uh, he also explored Alaska, like the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, he sailed into the Aleutian Islands. Um, so those are the things that he kind of found there. And he ends up dying on Bering Island, which you can see there uh, in, in that um, uh, map. Uh, they do think he did... Some of it's been found the Yukon River, uh, which empties out on the Alaskan coast there. Uh, and so that's going to be important later. The, the Russians will use this to try and colonize Alaska, which they will be successful with it, mostly for like the fur trade there. And uh, the R Russians will control Alaska until 1867, uh, until they sell the United States uh, under President Andrew Johnson. So... That's kind of like just like the preview of, of, of you know, what, what happens with the age of discovery, like with the background of it. And that's going to lead into like the colonization of, like you can see the Europeans are going to come back. Uh, they're going to begin conquering it uh, and colonizing it. And that's something later in the week I'll kind of go further into. We'll talk about, of course, the conquistadors uh, that come in. These are Spanish uh, soldiers and conquerors. Uh, that are mostly mercenaries, and uh, they'll they'll eventually start coming in like the Spanish. They'll start trying to colonize part of Latin America uh, and all that. So that's going to go into that next. So we'll talk about that later uh, in the week on Wednesday. But before we go, uh, don't forget uh, I've got some assignments, of course, that are out there. Uh, I think the two main things we got now is the Reformation quiz uh, that we have, of course, to do. Uh, so that's going to be, I think, due like early next week. Uh, there is a discussion thread I did post also uh, in uh, Canvas under discussions uh, about the study guide. Uh, so I think I've got some one question already done already for you. Uh, I've already put another one up for you. So, yeah, do send me those answers for those because um, I do want you to kind of help, you know, each other students out on the study guide. And you all are going to get bonus points, of course, for completing that. Uh, as well. So that's it for today. Uh, of course, I'll send out later uh, announcements probably sometime today about my upcoming lecture, of course, on the conquest of America. But pretty much that's it.
Uh, I don't think we have any questions right now, uh, as far as I know. Um, like none. But if you have any comments, questions, of course, about this lecture, you know, please, please let me know uh, pretty much uh, about that. Um, uh, pretty much uh, that's that's it for today uh, overall. But if you have any comments, questions about about this lecture, you know, please, of course, uh, let me know uh, about that. So anyway, y'all take care uh, and I'll see you, of course, um, uh, later in the week. So, so y'all, y'all, y'all take care.